Good morning, everybody. Welcome to another Friday workshop. Yeah, so I've got a question from Chris. It's, he says uh, he notices that NT slows down after a while with Bloodhound. Um, he's asking if there's anything you can do to speed it up. So, yeah, once again, I kind of need to know more detail about you know NT slowing down. What exactly is what exactly does that mean? You know, this just a little too vague for me to really give you an answer. For example, um, you know, is it is NT slowing down when Chris is using Bloodhound, or is it really more related to Raven? Um, so I can tell you, kind of a as a little tip here. This is kind of off topic, but um, when you're running a strategy in Ninja Trader. So, for example, um, in the strategy section right here, right? So, if you're running uh, a strategy such as Raven, uh, Ninja Trader Trader can actually not can, but Ninja Trader will start to slow down when when Ninja is starting to execute trades. Uh, so, when Raven or some other strategy starts executing trades. Um, after a while, Ninja will start to slow down when its database gets too full. So let me kind of give you an example here, right? So if we take a look, um, ah, shoot, I don't have any executions in here, but basically when you look at your execution and your order tabs, um, right? All this data here for the executions and stuff and your orders, that's all stored in Ninja's database. And when that database gets too full, it gets too large, um, the Ninja begins to really slow down because um, you know it just takes Windows a long time. It takes the operating system a long time to access a big database. Um, so I've seen that a lot. Um, and so the only way to fix it, what Ninja Trader will tell you to do is you have to go into your options. And let's see, where is our database? Um, here we go. Yeah, so under data, there's our, uh, we have, Ninja has a couple of options here to fix your database. So um, you don't actually want to repair the database. When it gets too big, what you have to do is just res reset the database. And what that does is it will erase all of your old trade information, all your trade data inside the database. And it'll shrink that database back down and make it real small. And then and then Ninja will run a lot faster again. Um, so that's just an issue with um, the database that Ninja is using. Um, you know, and so when that just gets too big, it just takes the software a long time to, to access that database. All right, so Ben, um, Ben is trying to accomplish uh, blocking a long signal. Uh, so if we have a long signal that's triggered within 10 ticks from a previous swing high. All right, a previous swing high. Um, yeah, so he's using the SI swings highs low indicator. Um, and of course, the opposite condition would be to block a short signal uh, from triggering if within 10 ticks of a previous swing low. Yeah, so what Ben is trying to do is. Um, is Ben doesn't want to take a trade going into resistance or support. Um, so that support resistance being the swing high or the swing low. Let's see. Um, all right, so a previous swing high. Okay. Yeah. All right, Ben. So let's see. Let me get... Uh, the uh, swing high low indicator on here. All 
All right, so I have my uh, swing highs, lows. I have it set so that we're just looking at the highest highs and the lowest lows here. All right, uh, let's see. Um, I'm going to up my number of swings by one. So I think, personal, I think that gives a little better result here. Okay, so we can see, right, the magenta and the blue lines are marking the uh, swing highs and swing lows. So, all right, I think we have a good, good example here. Um, so like right here, right? We have price coming up um, and approaching the the previous swing high. So, you know, so let's say. You know, we have a long signal and we want to prevent this long signal from, from firing off there. Uh, let's see. So, all right. I'll just kind of create a very simple uh, uh, trade signal here. All right, so I'm going to look at the uh, inflection point of the SMA 14. And, okay, yeah, there we go. So we have uh, the inflection point of our SMA 14 right there. Let's stretch this out. Okay, so there's our trade signal long. So, right, so our, our SMA, which is the white line, right, when it reverses direction, that's our inflection point. So there's kind of our, you know, very simplistic trade signal, right? Uh, okay. So our goal is uh, we want to make sure that uh, we're more than 10 ticks away from our uh, resistance line up here, right? So the blue line is our higher, our most recent higher high. So we want to block this trade here. So, um, so that, uh, let's see, Ben was watching a video that was using the comparison solver. Um, so let's see, yeah, we could use the comparison solver, um, but I would suggest using the support resistance solver. The support resistance is built for this exact uh, purpose. So let's take a look at this guy. All right, so let me put a name in here. Uh, all right, so we're looking at the, uh, the swing high high lows all right actually I'll be a little more specific we're actually looking at the highest highs and the lowest lows so all right and so with our support resistance solver um, we want to use headwind mode so when when we're trying to block trades going into support resistance right so we're blocking a trade going into support resistance that's headwind mode right so if 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 uh, we're taking a trade into uh, resistance up here then consider that think of that as like a headwind right so price is running into a headwind uh, when it's when price is running into a resistance area right that think of that as headwind so Right, the closer that price gets to our resistance lines, you know, the more price has to push harder and harder to break through that resistance, right? So that's kind of a, a headwind. So we're going to use headwind mode. Um, and next we're going to use an indicator, right? So we're using the swing highs, lows as our, as our support resistance indicator. So let's turn this on, set that to true. All right, so now we can see the indicator section opens up. So now we'll change our indicator. So let's go down here. 
find the swing highs lows right add it down here and um, let's see yep yeah, so there we go our number of swings is set to four right so you have to match these settings up with what you have on the chart and now let's um, we're using the widest plots so remember the widest plots are our highest highs and lowest lows so let's check both of those so um, you know just yeah, let me kind of back up here hopefully if you remember none of these were checked so the support resistance solver is very unique um, so none of these were checked so just remember that you do need to check something in order to actually use it um, so let, let me do this again here so with an SMA let's open this up um, and you know so with the SMA it was selected but when I go in here and replace that SMA with something it doesn't automatically check something so let's, let's put our swing high low in here and so you can see all of these are blank so just remember that when you change your indicator to what you're using to go in here and select the plots that you're using for your support and resistance so we're using the highest highs which is the widest tops and the lowest lows is the widest bottoms okay so there we go so we have our our plots selected and the next thing we need to do is um, set our our distance targets here so instead of using an ATR let's just go to ticks that's a little easier to visually see on the chart so change that to ticks change that to ticks and let's see Ben wants to use 10 ticks so I'm gonna set both of these to 10 ticks All right so uh, I don't want to go into a lot of detail because there's there are videos that explain how to use the support resistance solvers but once again we have an ideal distance and we have a minimum distance so these two distance targets allows you to set up to or allows you to use the fuzzy logic capabilities just like I explained in the slope solver right the slope solver had two different uh, had a minimum and maximum slope setting so the support this support resistance solver also has two different distances so you can utilize that fuzzy logic capabilities there um, but we're so we're just gonna um, set a, a fixed distance of 10 ticks keep it simple all right so let's before I continue let's take a look at our trade signal so let me mark it there all right so just so we're clear all right this is our trade signal here on this bar so now let's take a look at our support resistance solver and how this is set up so the way so the support resistance solver is used as a filter or as a permissive uh, to be more exact it's a permissive so you know what a permissive the way a permissive works uh, basically you know permissive short for permission so essentially our support resistance solver gives permission um, you know or gives a permissive to take a trade when you're using it um, so the way a permissive works is whenever you see a long output so you see the long output down here so this long output would and that will allow a long trade to take place now these two bars let's see let's grab here so these two bars where there's no long output that means no long trade no long signal can get through would, would be allowed through so in other words this effectively blocks a long signal and when we do have a long output that allows a long signal so if we take a look at these two bars up here um, you know what the support resistance solver is telling us is that this distance this distance 
is less than 10 ticks. And so definitely this distance is also less than 10 ticks. And now eventually price breaks through. Right, so price breaks through here. Let me draw my arrow down here. Price breaks through. And so we can see now we actually have a long output from our support resistance solver. And that's because price broke through our resistance line up here. And, and basically there's no resistance above it. So if there's no resistance above it, then you're free to take a long trade if you want. You know? So that's how the support resistance solver works, is it gives you a permissive or permission to take a trade. Right? So like down here, for example, um, let's see, yeah, so down here, yeah, let's take a look at these, these two bars here. Right here. So we can see we have this magenta, right, this magenta line here representing the previous lowest low swing point. And if we look at price, right, price is just barely above that swing low. So the support resistance solver has no, it's right, it's absent of a short output. So that means you couldn't take a short trade on these two bars because they're too close to our, you know, our detected lowest low. So, and then the next bar over here, basically what happens is a new low point was made. So our lowest low adjusts, and it, but price moved up, and now price is far enough away from our low point that we could actually take a short trade if, you know, if one, if one fired off. Right, so now basically all of these bars, you're, you would be, all these bars have a permissive to take a short trade um, to basically effectively take a short trade into our, our uh, swing low point there. Right. So that's uh, been, so that's all you need to do is just add this support resistance solver and of course Basically, you had to take your trade signal. So remember, this is our little simple trade signal here. And connect it to an AND node. Connect this into an AND node. And voila. And so now, we can see our... Let's disconnect that guy here. All right. So there's our trade signal. Um, unfiltered. And now if we add this support resistance permissive to it, now our trade signal is blocked. So let's take a look. So, all right. So here's a right along, but of course, our highest high is way up there. So that you know we can take a trade there. Um, oh, take a look at this, um, right here. So this looks like a good example here. Right. So our SMA uh, reversed down and gave us right this sell signal, but if we take a look at the filtered one, it's it's gone because price is too close to our swing low point there, so it got filtered out. All right, so there's a another signal and there's another signal so let's take a look at the filtered ones and yeah so they both got filtered out because they're just uh, the closing price is too close to our swing points here so all right so there you go let's see let me just uh, I guess tell you guys about a little uh, give you guys a reminder here uh, on our website so we do have a new section on our website um, I think I had announced this 
a couple weeks back, but uh, under our partners, we also now have a Bloodhound community, and um, I'm waiting for people to kind of get back to me. I've had a couple of uh, Bloodhound users who wanted it, who um, some of them have a blog, one of them wants to set up a uh, kind of a, a, a big mics, you know, uh, question and answer forum type deal for Bloodhound users. Um, and so, the, you know, so they're not actual partners of ours, but, you know, but they are people who um, are using Bloodhound and kind of want to help others and, and, and so forth. So um, I've only got two people on here. Basically, I just have a link to uh, the Big Mike's link to our Bloodhound section up on Big Mike's. Um, and we do have one company up here, uh, Remick. So this is a unique gentleman who's up in Canada, but he he uh, speaks uh, a foreign language. Let's see, I think I can't remember which country he came from, but I think it was one of Russian, one of the Russian satellite countries he came from. Uh, you know, so he speaks a. Oh, there we go, Hungarian. Ah, great. Yeah, so he speaks Hungarian, Hungarian and German. Um, so he's kind of out there to help Bloodhound users uh, who need help in uh, Hungarian and German language. Uh, and we should, there's at least, uh, I think, four other people who I'm waiting to get a resp response back from on there. So, uh, let's see. Um, what other? Let me see if there's some other kind of tips and tricks. Um, yeah, let me show you some new, some other, some new pages that have been added. So if we go to Learn Bloodhound, right, brings us to the documentation page. So I have revamped some uh, some new pages here to give you guys some information, right? So just a kind of quick overview, right? So we have a, a video section um kind of we have a, a a ordered kind of learning uh lesson structured uh to learn bloodhound so you can go through all three of these pages and it'll step you through some videos uh one at a time um to uh teach you how to use bloodhound um, and then down here in the bloodhound reference right this is just the, uh, the documentation on each of the Bloodhound solvers, uh, the logic nodes, and the function nodes. But further down, um, right, um, we've got documentation on how Chameleon works and the SI swings and the swings highs lows. Right, there's some examples and uh, an explanation of how those indicators work. Uh, and then down here, I revamped um, I revamped the um, third party indicators that don't play well with Bloodhound. So basically this is uh, let's see if I click on that. Yeah. So this is a list of indicators that have that don't work with Bloodhound or have known issues um, with Bloodhound. So um, basically I get this list from you guys because um, there's no way for us to test all the indicators out there especially indicators that you have to pay for so for example Ninjacators um, they're one of our partners but not all of their indicators work with Bloodhound so there are some indicators here that um, that uh, I have been able to ident identify that aren't currently working with Bloodhound. So we're hoping that they'll take the time to kind of uh, get them working with Bloodhound. Um, right. Yeah, so let's see, let's back up here. Oh, where'd that go? And then there's, so I'm back on the uh, Bloodhound's documentation page. So back to the menu here. Now there's also a section here of indicators that do work with Bloodhound. So I do really want to start tracking 
third-party, you know, paid indicators that do work with Bloodhound. Um, you know, so if you guys are using any third-party paid indicators that you know are working with Bloodhound, um, I would appreciate hearing from you guys. You know, if you could send me a screenshot and um, uh, and you know, tell me the exact name of the indicator, who the company is. Um, you know, that would be helpful so I can add that to this list here. All right, so we can see that under indicators there are also indicators that are known to work with Bloodhound as well. So, um, let's see. Yeah, here, here's a neat indicator um, that uh, someone had told me about, or actually reminded me of, of this ultimate expressions. So this is an indicator that allows you to do mathematical calculations. So the indicator can take, um, like you can take any instrument uh, value, you can calculate instrument spreads with this. So this ultimate expression indicator allows you to take two different instruments and calculate the mathematical spread. And I've done some testing with this in Bloodhound and I found it to work uh, within Bloodhound. Uh, so someone did a really excellent job in making that, that indicator. Um, so I don't think, I didn't really find a manual for this thing. So it's not, I will say that I didn't find it all that easy to use, but um, uh, but it is available on NinjaTrader support form. You can just do a search for that there. And it looks like I need to fix that link there. That's not an indicator. Um, so, yeah. So if you guys have anything to add to this list, uh, I would appreciate that. So, let's see. All right. Looks like I got a question from Gary here. So let's let me take a look. All right. So Gary would like to set up a watch list. Uh, all right. So Gary would like to scan multiple you know, charts, uh, I guess multiple instruments, multiple time frames, uh, each watching the same uh, trigger, triggering condition. Um, yeah, so Gary, you can, the, the way you do that in Ninja, uh, let's see, so, yeah, so Gary, let me uh, show you what you'd want to do. So I'll give you a brief explanation, Gary, and then I'll show you uh, a video. So there's already a couple of workshop videos that cover this. Um, I can go into a, a lot of detail here. So let's see. Let's close Bloodhound down. So bring up the uh, control center. So as you guys may know, Ninja has a market analyzer. Right. So the market analyzer is what allows you to scan um, let's see uh, yeah the market analyzer right allows you to scan a lot of different instruments so let's uh, take some of these old instruments out here so I need to update my instrument list right so we have a list of instruments and of course, you can gather any kind of data that you want, right? Um, and so, also in the market analyzer, what we can do is we can add a column here, and we can add a column that looks at an indicator, right? So, uh, let's add that down here, and just to kind of give you a simple example here there's our indicator the ADL um, so let's see let me I'll just change it to something uh, something simple like the MACD um, and let's apply that right so we can see we added a new column here a fourth column um, and that's just spitting out the MACD value, right, for each of these instruments. Um, and each of these instruments 
and you, so you can see the uh, the data series is set to a one minute chart right so this is the MACD value of a one minute chart for each of these instruments so that's what you want to use as the market analyzer and of course you can put bloodhound in here so we um, yep so we uh, made bloodhound compatible with the market analyzer so I can select bloodhound and right and so you can see that there's a, a unique um, section here some unique settings that are, are um, specific to bloodhound right so you have your threshold values uh, right you can send an email of course there's the template so that's where you would load up your bloodhound template um, and let's see yeah the racing stripes aren't going to do anything inside the market analyzer um, you know but um, uh, let's see here and one other important thing to note is the plot so we built a spe special plot for the market analyzer right so when you're using blood on the market analyzer you make make sure you you're using the market analyzer plot right using that plot there and then all right so basically you load up your bloodhound template um, you know to, for the bloodhound signals that you wanted to see then you can go through set up your cell conditions if that's what you want to do um, and so when you're using bloodhound in the market analyzer right instead of seeing values like the MACD you'll see ones and zeros primarily right most people's bloodhound signals usually output a one or a zero and so that's what you'll see is you'll see the bloodhound's output value in the market analyzer here um, let's see so let's close that um, and all right yeah so in the market analyzer if you get a, a if you get a long signal you know basically the market analyzer will give you a positive one value and if you get a cell signal right if if bloodhound generates a cell signal in the market analyzer you get a negative one value there so um so to kind of go into more depth here uh, Gary let me show you a video and you can watch this video whenever you have the time uh, so let, we'll just do us all right so I'm at, uh, I'm at YouTube right now right guys so I'm at YouTube and I'm using the search tool so you just type in the word bloodhound workshop uh, make sure you do include blood workshop otherwise it comes up with a lot of other bloodhounds and then after Bloodhound Workshop, put in the, the thing that you're looking for. So, um, so we'll put in the market analyzer. And um, there we go. First one, uh, first one on here using the market analyzer. So, I, I know there's, yeah, there's going to be a couple of videos up here already using the market analyzer um, let's see uh, yeah I think the top one here uh, is the most recent yep so it's probably going to be the best one um, and then the second one down here uh, yeah it looks like Daniel Rowe had uh, done some demonstrations on using the market analyzer right. uh, let's see and I know there's some other videos that have the Mac market analyzer um, as questions in them but this first one I think this is the one where that was my primary focus for the workshop was using the market analyzer so all right Gary so there you go you can just watch that at uh, whenever you at your convenience there all right um, let's see um, yeah let me guys show you some other helpful resources uh, 
while we're on this topic, right? So kind of one of the easiest ways to look for something that you're doing is just use YouTube and your search terms. Um, but you can also go to our website. So there's a section on our website here. So let's go back to our website. So there we go. So if we go to support, go down to learn, and over here, here's um, training workshops, right? So we have a list of training workshops. I'll click on that. And this has a list. So we started keeping a list about uh, a little more than six months ago. Uh, towards the end of last year, uh, we started keeping a, a detailed list um, aside. I mean, there's also, right, in, in, in YouTube, um, you know, in YouTube, if you click on a video, and yeah, let me turn that off. If you click on a video, right, there is a description of what this video covers, but also on our website, we also have a list of, of I, I think, yeah, going back about uh, eight months or so, we have a list of videos here, so you can see the date. Um, you can click on this link, and it'll open up the YouTube video for you. Right, if, I, if I click on this guy down here. It's going to open up YouTube, right? So, so if you want to see a list of videos, you know, all in one spot, there you go. So, um, and you can use uh, your browser's search term. Your, you can use your browser's search capability, right? So most browsers, if you hold down the control key and click and click F, so Control F. So let's see, this is Internet Explorer. So Internet Explorer has a little find thing right there. And so, um, yeah, so there we go. If I search for market, uh, there we go, boom, it jumps down here. And so we can see, so this workshop video back in April has a quick lesson on using Bloodhound in the market analyzer. Right, so that's just a quick video. I think the the video we found on YouTube is a more uh, detailed, uh, more detailed workshop on the market analyzer. Right, so that's kind of another way you can search this list is use your browser's um, find tool to do that. So Chrome and Firefox, they all they they have find tools as well. They're just in different locations. So if you use Chrome, the find is going to be up here. If you use Firefox, your little find tool is going to be down here. All right. Well, with that, guys, um, let's see. Yeah, I guess we'll wrap it up.